And welcome to the live stream, everybody. I'm David Burns. Thanks for joining me, Beak Squad. We're a big family of beekeepers who like to get together and just talk bees and other things sometimes on our live stream. So I want to welcome you all. All of you are coming in from everywhere, even the Caribbeans. Wow. I'm jealous. That sounds like a wonderful place to be, but uh, we appreciate all of you for tuning in tonight. You are one big family that we enjoy uh, talking with, spending time with. Uh, so much Mexico and Texas and wow, just all over New York. Yeah. South Central Indiana close by. It's when I'm on the ham radio talking to people, I'm usually talking to people in across the world and it's kind of fun. It's good to see you guys all around uh, the U.S. here and even outside the U.S. as well, Palm Beach. Wow. So thanks for joining us tonight on our live stream and uh, hope you had a good day. Look at that. Fort Worth, Indiana, Tennessee, California, Nevada. Hey, I said Nevada right. When I was in uh, Nevada speaking last February, <laughs> one of my, there's Ohio, Missouri, Michigan, California, Wisconsin, Indiana. But when I spoke in Nevada, I accidentally said Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> quickly. It was like, you know, a pin drop in the room. Did he just say Nevada? <laughs> and they quickly uh, pulled me aside and said, okay, let's practice saying it correctly. <laughs> and they asked me to speak again in February. So I'm going back to Nevada and to speak out there. And uh, maybe if you're in that area, you can look that up and uh, join me. I think it's the Nevada State Bee Conference. And uh, my friend John Zavishlak, Dr. John Zavishlak, and I be out there as a team. We're looking forward to, we do a lot of speaking together, traveling together, so we have a good time. Um, so, yeah, good to see you guys from all over the place tonight uh, joining us. And uh, some of you are certainly in places where you don't worry about the winter as much as I do. And then some of you are in places where you have to worry more about the winter. And uh, I want to talk about the, not, that tonight. I want to talk about getting your bees ready for winter. I tell you, there's a lot going on in beekeeping. When I first started beekeeping in the early 90s, I don't know. It didn't seem like there wasn't much going on in beekeeping. I mean, you know, we didn't have the Internet. Communication, social media was zilcho. If you wanted to know something about beekeeping, you had to read it in a book. <laughs> or you had to know somebody that knew more than you did. And uh, so that was kind of hard when I first got started in beekeeping. But now, oh my gosh, every day there's something new in beekeeping. Either scientists are doing studies or YouTubers are making new content. People are making new products faster than we can actually try them out. It's really scary. There's a new, there's a new chemical. There's a new treatment. There's a new gizmo and gadget just coming off the press instantly. Even before, I think sometimes they've been adequately proven to be useful. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm leery of some things just because I'm an old man, I guess. But, you know, it's like there, I fought the new hive tools for a while. I don't have one with me. But, you know, I, I just grew up using the old traditional hive tool. And then when these newfangled hive tools came out, man, I really resisted. When that J-hook came out, I'm like, yeah, I don't like the J-hook. And then one day I kind of figured out how to use it. Oh, my gosh, I can't really work a beehive without a J-hook. <laughs> I have two now. I do have to have filed them down, grind them down. And if you've ever watched my videos, you see me doing that. They're just a little too big to work for me until I ground them, grind them down a little bit. So anyway, there's a lot of new things coming out about getting your bees through the winter. And I think it's fun. I think we do have to embrace all the new things that are uh, being presented to us. You know, hey. Uh, some of us don't always embrace new things quickly, but a lot of those things after time, we realize, hmm, those kind of work pretty good. But when it comes down to it, beekeeping really hasn't, I'll give you a secret, hasn't changed all that much. It really hasn't. I know it's kind of weird to think that, like, yeah, it's changed a lot. Well, it has, but it really hasn't. I mean, when I first started beekeeping, um, not much is different. We used solid bottom boards, screen bottom boards weren't around. We used wax foundation that we had to wire in, embed the wire with pins. We had to, you know, play with frames a lot more back then. But the traditional Langstroth box, it was the same, uh, not much difference there. And the way we kept bees were, was the same until mites showed up. And then that was a little bit different, but basically the same. But now there's more people that are just inventing a lot of different things. When I go to conferences, it's amazing. 
how many different uh, vendors are there and how many different gadgets they have to sell. It's amazing. And I got to be honest, sometimes I watch people walk out of conferences with a lot of unnecessary things. But, you know, it's fun buying things and trying them. I get that. So when it comes to winter, though, not a lot different there on kind of getting your bees through the winter. I've read a lot of uh, uh, documentations of Reverend Langstroff. He did a lot of work on his book, The Hive and the Honeybee. Uh, he was around in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s. He, of course, came up with the Langstroff type uh, configuration of, of, of these, uh, these frames that we can take in and out. And um, so his hive really hasn't changed at all that much at all. And uh, But uh, the idea of overwintering, he wrote about in that book a lot. And I read that book many, many times. He has a good section on how you need to ventilate your hive in the wintertime. And this was in Ohio when he did a lot of his work with bees. So, you know, he lost a lot of hives in the wintertime before mites. Um, so wintertime is hard on bees. It really is. And there is a lot of research now available to us uh, that has studied bees in the wintertime, their, their cluster, how they cluster, what temperatures they cluster in. So I want to talk to you today about preparing your bees for winter. Now, I know some of you uh, have been very successful at overwintering. Good for you. Yay. You have already successfully overwintered your hive a year or two or three or 10 years, and you're proud of that, and you should be. Others of you are sort of like, oh, no, winter's coming. Last winter, I lost all my bees. And you're just like, oh, I can't, I can't take this again if they all die again. So I understand how difficult that is to try to, like, like check off the list. You know, what did I do wrong last year? One of my bees die in the wintertime. I felt like I did everything perfectly during the year. And I'll, and get this, sometimes you can do everything correct and your bees still die. That's just a fact. Um, um, yeah, I think like I, I see Brian just said, of my 16, if I lose, if I lose more than three, I'll be upset. Oh, lose more than three. I'll lose one or more than three. So yeah, I understand. Right now, the statistics show that about 50% of bees are lost in the wintertime. 50% of hives are that, that beekeepers keep perish in the winter hot in the wintertime. That means if you have you know 10 colonies, statistics show that you're only going to come out of winter with five. This is bad. If you have two, you'll come out of winter with one. And if you have one, you'll come out of winter with half of a half of a hive or no hive at all, I'm afraid. You know, uh, two is one and one is none. That's why it's scary just to have one hive. So listen, bees can die in the wintertime when you do everything right. What, well, why is that? It's the same with any living thing. Let's take a human. You can exercise, eat right, all your stats and all your blood uh, counts look great. Everything is just perfect, right? We've heard these stories. Everything is perfect. Boom. Somebody died of a heart attack or something unexpected. And, and a health issue just came up. And yet they did everything correctly. How does that happen? Why does that happen? Bees are the same way. You can do everything perfectly for your bees and they can still crash because there are things that we don't see that are going on in the colony. And that can be something as simple as viruses. And that even though you kept your mite levels below, you know, 3% or below, that was still enough to spread viruses in the hive. And get this, viruses were around in bees before we had mites. Okay, so that's that's just a known. Bees were dying from viruses before mites showed up. So it doesn't always mean that mites were the culprit of spreading those viruses. So we have things working against us. Now, with more pressure now today, we have pressure coming uh, in on bees from like the the environment is different. We're having less and less foraging opportunities. More and more yards are kept perfect and more and more weeds are trimmed and more asphalt and concrete goes up where it used to be weeds that bees, you know, weeds are great for bees. They love weeds and we don't like weeds. So weeds are going away. So our environment is changing. Mono crops and big fields like here in Illinois, corn and beans, which bees really don't care at all for. I know they like soybeans, but not really. They don't. Uh, not when there's clover available. So we're losing more of the natural 
uh, nectar sources for bees. So they do have a lot more pressure. And then we do have the introduction of small hive beetle, came in the country in the 80s. We had the Vora Destructor, or 90s. We had the Vora Destructor came in in the 80s. And, and we just have more um, pathogens that we are discovering and bees are fighting quite a battle. So it's really a lot tougher. So let me just talk to you. Let's, let's categorize preparing your bees for winter in two different categories. We'll first start with the bees. The second category or topic, I guess, will be preparing your hive. Now, the hive, this part here, this is called a hive. I said this in one of my videos, I think, today. Uh, this is a hive. My lens needs cleaned off. But um, this hive doesn't have any bees in it. It's still called a beehive. Now, the bees in it are called the colony. So you have a hive with a colony of bees that go inside of it, if you ever want to think of it that way. But most people call their bees a hive. How many hives do you have? They're really talking about colonies that are inside of hives. So let's talk about the colony, the bees first. Um, you know, there, there are several things we need to think about preparing our bees for winter. Preparing bees for winter starts in the very first day of spring, either when you get your new package or nucleus, or you overwinter your bees and you start to make a split. <laughs> there went a whole bunch of balloons. And uh, so when you make that split, then certainly you're, you're thinking, wow, I need to do something with my bees. If you get a new package, you're like, I got to do something. From, the, from day one, you're, you're really just preparing for winter from the very first day you start beekeeping. You really are. If you notice a video that I made a couple of days ago, I looked at a hive that's really struggling. It didn't take long for me at all to determine what caused the struggle. Did you see that video? Well, I hate to give it away, but it was, uh, they have 20 frames, but they're only on one side, five frames on each side. And when I began looking at the frames, I noticed they had a problem that I just wasn't in there enough last uh, season um, to, to, to watch it and to catch it. But the problem was, they swarmed at least once because I saw swar old swarm cells. And they also um, superseded the queen maybe once or twice. Oh, uh, thanks, Mark, for your uh, donation tonight. Appreciate that. Found a new colony hanging out at the bottom of my beehive last week. Put a new colony on. Yeah, let's talk about that in just a minute. Bees on the bottom of a bottom board. I like that. So, um, you know, when you start thinking about this hive that I looked at, instantly I knew queen problem. They swarm, so they had to raise a new queen. They raised a new queen, which takes about 30 days before you get a good layer. That didn't work out good for them, so they kept superseding her once or twice. That's going to take a while, too. So they went so long without being queen right that colony lost population, and now they're down to not many bees. And they're trying to struggle. So, you know, sometimes you can look at that. So the minute you start keeping bees, you have to keep your eye on your bees. So you got to go into winter knowing you have a good colony. And if you don't, then you need to combine that colony with another colony that's equally weak or maybe strong. But you need to say, this, this colony, it went bad. Something went wrong. I didn't catch it. My fault or whatever. And I need to combine it. It's not going to make it through winter. So I really, you know, my other colonies uh, that I use for my YouTube studio here, got about 20 hives here that I, I film a lot in. Um, they are doing fantastic. They have strong, strong uh, bees, strong queens. And, um, you know, they're just boiling over with bees. That's really what you want to see. So you got to have, and, and the bees themselves, you've got to have bees of winter physiology. Does everybody know how much I talk about bees of winter physiology? Oh my gosh, these bees live four to eight months. So that's what I'm raising in October by feeding my bees. I'm raising bees of winter physiology. I got to give them one-to-one -to, -one to stimulate that. That's really important to me. Hi, Leah. And I, that Leah is probably there with my granddaughter, uh, Vera. Hi, Vera. Super sticker. Thank you for that. Appreciate you guys watching. Had supper with them a couple of nights ago. And uh, so you got to really think about my bees. You know, am I, do they, do they have enough bees of winter physiology? And that's what you try to do. That's what I discovered many years ago is that, oh my gosh, once I raise more bees of winter physiology, my bees made it through winter flying colors, no problems at all. But that means four to six frames of brood that I can visually see capped over in the month of October. Because when those bees emerge, guess what? They're winter bees. They're going to live into April and May. And that's when our winter breaks and everything gets better. 
So in my case, that's what I do. I try to feed right now and raise bees when in physiology. But get this, I, I keep feeding them all winter long with the same thing in a candy form. So my bees continue to raise uh, bee, more bees, more brood all winter long. And you can watch my videos. I made a video today showing you what bees do when they, they eat that candy board, how big they are uh, going into winter, in winter, how, how many bees are in there. So it is amazing. Now, another thing you got, you got to do is mite control. Now, let's wait a minute. You may not like controlling mites, but you got to do it. You got to control your mites. And I just made a video. I haven't published it yet. I used Formic Pro. I waited about a week and a half or two weeks. Took the pads off at the time it says, and then did a mite test. So you watch that video. You'll find out if Formic Pro killed my queen, hurt the brood, all that stuff is going to be important to look at. Um, but you got to keep your mites under control. Now's the time to do it. Maybe your temperature is correct now where you live for mite control. So that's going to be important too. Hello from Las Vegas. Just received your winner be kind board. Thanks for shipping it so quickly. That's a board without candy. We are shipping those. Uh, the ones with candy won't ship out till December. So yeah, I'm glad you got that, Angela. That's awesome. Uh, that's sometimes a, a relief knowing you can put those candy boards on there. So now the next thing you need to think about with your bees is not just feeding them, not just controlling mites, because I know there's a lot of different ways to control mites. I'm not going to tell you which way. That's for you to decide based on your temperature, your bees, your preference, your philosophy of chemicals versus no chemicals and all that. But the quality of the queen is essential as well. You gotta have a good layer. That's all it is to it. You gotta have a good quality queen. Um, and that's something that's gonna be really tough to negotiate now. It's harder to find queens this time of the year because it's just getting later and it may be too late for some people. So be very careful about killing your queen on your fall inspections. Be very careful. When you do an inspection, you find your queen on a frame, set that frame aside, you know, put it aside somewhere so you don't accidentally kill the queen or something. Um, but you want to have a good queen. And uh, that's what I mean. You watch that all year long from the day you start. And if you see you don't have a good queen laying good brood, uh, like April or May or June, that's a good time to replace her. I always say you need to have a, a good queen by summer solstice, June the 20th. 20th or 21st. So you got to have the queen, the hive needs to be queen right by the 21st of June. And then one of the things you need to think about too, I showed a video this week as well for you guys. You got to be able to equalize your hives. That's something I learned from commercial beekeepers a long time ago, but it's a practice that I really like doing it, is taking a look at your hive and saying, this hive needs a more brood. So you take a frame of capped over brood from a strong colony put it into another frame, another hive that needs more brood. And you don't want to give them open brood because they have to care for that. That takes more energy. But a capped over uh, pupae, and that's going to be emerging any day, can instantly become part of the nurse bees, workforce, support the queen who's laying eggs. So equalizing your hives, that means also moving uh, resources around. Maybe a hive needs uh, another frame of honey or bee bread or something. Equalize that out. It's quite incredible what you can do if you have more than one hive is to help equalize the hives so they're, they're all strong rather than one gigantically strong one and one little weak one. <laughs> all right, let's talk about the hive, the actual woodenware. Now, uh, woodenware is important going into winter. Let's talk first about a mouse guard. A lot of you have entrance reducers that you've probably reduced to cut down on robbing. Maybe you have some robber screens on there. You can go through the winter with a robber screen on there, but, uh, you know, sometimes that gets clogged up, but sometimes the bees can clean that out. But it's going to be up to you to keep that cleaned out, by the way. So it's really tough. If There are a lot of bees that die in the wintertime naturally. So don't panic on a snowy day when you go out there and you see all these dead bees in the snow around your hive. There's no reason to email us when you see that. That's normal. That's normal. Uh, biology of bees is how the hive works. It, it, it happens, okay? They're going to get rid of their dead sisters on the bottom board and they just take them outside and throw them in the snow. You don't see them now. They're out there now, the same volume, but they just blend in with the grass. You don't see them. But when they stand out in the snow, you're panicking. Oh my gosh, my bees are dying. They're laying in the snow. Some of them you can watch fly out of the hive and land in the snow. 
And I always feel like these are just at the end of their life and they're like, yeah, I'm out of here. <laughs> and they just go out there and die. So don't panic. That's going to happen. But a mouse guard is probably something I personally would not leave on in the wintertime because sometimes I need to use um, one of those blue scra plastic scrapers that you push into your bottom board and rake all the dead bees out. Just kind of keep it a little more tidy. So that's something you may have to do as well. Um, but uh, the mouse guard is important on the hive. The um, you, Let's talk about wrapping a hive. Is it important to wrap a hive? Yes and no. I don't really have never really found a value in wrapping hives. I don't see any difference in wrapping a hive. Bees cluster, and so they do pretty well uh, clustering together. A strong colony does. They don't really need the wrap. A little weak colony, or if you're trying to overwinter a nucleus, or a little uh, single deep, and it gets 20 below zero, wrapping would help, absolutely. <laughs> but something works better for me than wrapping, and that's a windbreak. Same with my house. If I can, if the wind isn't blowing, my furnace doesn't run as much in the wintertime. But it can be warmer and windier. My furnace runs more than when it's colder and not windy. Same with bees. So bees are going to work harder to stay warm the more windy it is. So if you can provide a wind break. Now, some people take bales of straw or hay. Don't put it right up against the hive because that can be a problem. Uh, too much moisture. So kind of keep it away from the hive a couple of feet uh, or a building. If you can move them after it gets really cold, you can move your bees around. They're not foraging, right? There's nothing to forage on. And so you can move them on the south side of a building in the sun. Wow, that always works for me. I've had the most success overwintering bees on the south side of a building. But unfortunately, we have a lot of deliveries where I like to keep my bees. My delivery guys and pickup guys are kind of like, yeah. A lot of bees here. <laughs> so Sherry said, let's get these away from here. Hey, Art, um, I saw your video on moving hives, but it didn't say how to turn a hive 180 degrees. Yeah. Okay. Turning a hive 180 degrees. Let me get to that. So I have two questions, bottom board, a hive, and turning 180. See if I can remember that. I'll leave it up to Jessica and Sherry, our administrators behind the scenes, maybe to remind me. Um, so wrapping a hive, windbreak is more important, really is. Doesn't have to be anything incredible, just something to cut down on sheer wind hitting that hive. What about bottom boards, solid bottom boards, screen bottom boards? Again, no real big difference for me. And I think it's going to be up to you and your personal preference. Um, personally, no, I'm not saying you have to do this. This is what I've experienced. And that is, if I keep my bottom boards closed off, I get more debris and junk on the bottom board. If I keep my winter bee or the winter bee kinds on the top with a vent and I have my screens open on the bottom, more of the debris falls out and it's a cleaner hive, I believe. I've had small hive beetle actually pupate in the debris on a solid bottom board. Isn't that awful? There's so much garbage and debris down there. They can actually... Uh, the um, larvae go, go down there and pupate, become adult beetles on your bottom board in that crap down there. So I'm not crazy about it, but I think it works to go with the solid. I've got some hives here that are solid bottom boards. I just kind of keep cleaning them out. Some are, most of them are screen bottom boards. So again, I don't want wind to blow up into the hive. So if it's on a high stand, you need to probably bring some insulation around the stand or something around the hive so wind doesn't blow up into the screen. Um, so let me just uh, share a few more things about how I do it. Now, this is not the way you have to do it. I don't have all the information. I saw Brian said he uses some um, insulated inner covers. That's similar to what my Winter Be Kind is. The Winter Be Kind replaces my inner covers and it has insulation in it, but it also has candy that absorbs the moisture and makes that candy pl pliable to eat for the bees. Um, <clears throat> so what I do, I get my bees ready for winter and I'll, I'll just uh, configure them in such a way where it'd be two deeps. And I'm in Illinois. I have to have two deeps for the brood area. And they have some honey down there. I usually leave a honey super on that's completely filled up, not two supers, but one. If a super isn't all the way filled up, I won't use it because that can mislead the bees to think there's food up there. There's not. Then I put my winter bee kind on top of that. with got the little entrance uh, at the top. And so that is my go-to uh, way to doing it. 
in a video that I made and I posted it just an hour or two ago, you can see the winter bee kind being consumed in the winter time and how much they eat in two weeks and how big the colony gets in the winter time. Again, this is weird, but I have more bees in the winter time than I do any other time of the year because winter bees don't die and I raise more bees all winter long and it's just a big, big hive coming out of, and you can watch that on my videos, by the way. So that's basically how I get my bees through the winter is I've got to feed them heavily now to raise bees of winter physiology, control mites, good queen, uh, windbreak, mouse guards, if you need to keep mice out of there, solid or screen, bottom board, doesn't seem to matter. Now, I'm going to talk about some issues. Now, snow and ice. It doesn't, it hasn't really snowed a lot. I don't even think I plowed one time last year in Illinois. But we've had a lot of big snows that have completely covered my hives. And if you get a lot of snow and ice, it can be detrimental to your bees because they do need air. And so a big ice storm that cuts off all air supply, if you have a solid bottom board, that can be really bad. So you have to go out there and be diligent to scrape snow off of wherever the ventilation is. How are they getting air? In my situation, I've got a screen bottom board, a slot in my winter be kind. So it's a passive airflow that they can have. I just need to make sure that the winter be kind hole it, it never gets covered up because it's under the top cover, the telescoping top cover. So it, even if it snows or freezes, it doesn't block that off. So they always have air. I like that part of it. And then, uh, but if you don't have that, if your hive's all, you know, sealed up, wrapped up, and then snow covers it, kind of have to go out there and clean it up a little bit. Um, the other thing is um, the wind can blow things over. Um, it can be really windy in the wintertime. It can blow your hive over. The hive kind of gets, the propolis gets really brittle too. And so be careful about that. You know, you've got to sometimes use a tie down strap. If you're like me, you live on the prairie and it's don't have a lot of wind protection. Don't let it get blown off. Don't let the top get blown off. That's, that's really important too. And then those of you that live in bear country, you're going to have to get an electric fence. Make sure the bears stay out of your hive in the winter time. For those of you that don't have bears, but you may have raccoons, they can sometimes try to get the tops off of hives too. Raccoons can and get in there. So be careful about that. Keep an eye on that. What about heaters? What about heating pads, heating lamps? What about putting them in uh, indoors, like inside a building? What about a greenhouse? All of these things, a heating lamp and so on. Well, in a nutshell, kind of a waste of time. You shouldn't have to do that. A strong colony doesn't need baby like that. It really doesn't. Um, it needs uh, to be able to make its own heat. It shouldn't have to need a heat lamp or a heater. Uh, it, it doesn't need a greenhouse. Problem with the greenhouse, when your bees fly out, they go up to the top of the greenhouse where the light is. All bees are attracted to light. And they just stay there forever until they die trying to get out to the light. So I've never been a fond fan of that. I've tried different things uh, similar to that, and it can be catastrophic pretty quickly. Moving them indoors isn't bad. A lot of Canadian beekeepers do that. People in Alaska in real cold climates will in, put bees indoors. But the trick to that is you, it needs to be climate controlled. You need to keep it around 35 to 43 degrees or something like that. And uh, the bees have to kind of be in a dark room. I mean, really dark, no light leaks at all. Red light's okay, but it's a whole management issue. I've tried it before, but on a warm day, it warms up. All the bees kind of get too hot in those rooms. So it's, it's scary to try to do it indoors unless you really know what you're doing. Now, last year I did take the circle hive. You know, it's still doing good by the way. And I put it in uh, the chicken coop that doesn't have any chickens in it. And the little thing overwintered well, that we'll be moving it back in there again. So that's kind of a, in a nutshell and a quick rundown of how I like to actually overwinter my hives. Now let's talk about the beehive under the hive. Um, it's not uncommon for a hive to develop on a, under, under a hive. I've seen it more on screen bottom boards. The, the pheromones of the hive are strong. Sometimes it can be a stray queen that flies under there. Sometimes it can be one of your uh, colonies, a uh, queen that maybe uh, they replace the queen and she, when she landed, she crawled under there and stayed under there. I've seen pictures of lots of comb under there and you see a lot of comb under there. <laughs> yeah, that's a hive under there. 
And so what you have to do when you see a lot of bees under there is investigate and correct it. Don't leave it like that. You have to take the hive apart, take the top off, super off, the deeps off, get to the bottom board, take the bottom board off, turn it upside down or start working on it and fix it. Shake the bees in a new hive. If there's a queen in there, make a, it's like a swarm you call, right? If there's no queen there, then shake the bees somewhere into another colony or do a newspaper, something like that. So that cannot be left that way. Thank you, Matthew, for the super sticker. Appreciate that tonight. All right, we talked about moving a hive 180 degrees. That was one of the questions. Um, so basically, that's a question where some of you saw a video I made where you wondered why I had a beehive facing directly to a building. And that's because I made a split several years ago. And so the bees, it was in the same yard, and I didn't want the bees to go back to the mother hive. So I took the split three or four feet away and made it face the wall. So when the foragers went out, they found that wall uh, a trigger to make them take a new orientation flight. And so my intention was to take this hive, here it is, that was facing the wall like this, and I was going to move it two or three inches a day until I made it face 180 degrees that way. Is that, yeah, it's 180. So they would be like going in and out this way where I wanted them to. But I never got around to it, and they seemed happy there, so there they sit. And so, but if you want to move... Uh, rotate hives like that. You can always move a hive a few inches a day. I experimented with that this year, several videos, and you can watch me that. I battled that. One time I moved it six inches and the hive didn't like it. They were so confused just moving at six inches. That's crazy. The bottom board's 14 inches wide. Six inches really disturbed them. I had to put it back a few more inches. A couple inches uh, does upset them, but they get used to it pretty quick. So, yeah. Oh, was there a third question? I don't remember. I don't think so. All right. So <clears throat> that's a great, uh, great little summary of wintering your hives. And, and by the way, last week we talked about not complicating beekeeping. And I know that when you start thinking about overwintering your bees, it's real easy to complicate it. So don't complicate it. Keep it simple. <laughs> All right. Do you have any questions for me tonight? Hi, Deborah. Oh, it was awesome to see you had the veil on Bobblehead David. I made it a little, I made it a little big. Yeah, I mean, David, look, Bobblehead David, where's he at now? He's not working right now. He's off where he gets off at five o'clock. I can't get him to work extra hours on live stream. But um, yeah, he's, uh, I guess he's, he looks bigger on TV, doesn't he, than he does uh, in person. So yeah, it's a little big, but it was fun putting on Bobblehead David. That was cute. Thanks for doing that, Deborah. Hey Dina, need to remove uh, need to remove larvae from frames. What is the best way to do this? Internal Falls, Minnesota. Need to remove larvae from frames. Why? Why would you remove larvae from frames? You'll have to leave another comment, and we'll pick that up because I need to know what you're doing there. I don't understand why you would leave, uh, want to remove larvae. You'd want those to be in there to become bees. A little confused. Okay. Jason, thanks for your donation. Video of the step-by-step -step process for candy board. Yeah. You know, I think we made one of those a long time ago. I remember that. It's it's in my arsenal of 600 videos that I've made since 208 or 2008. I made 600 videos, I think. And I'm the longest running, oldest beekeeper, oldest beekeeping channel not the oldest beekeeper, oldest beekeeping channel on YouTube that I know of. Nobody's uh, told me they were any longer running for me. So all that time I've made a lot of videos. So I think I'm pretty sure we made a video step-by-step -step process. The trick to making candy boards is of course, being a candy expert. Knowing how to make candy has always been a challenge for most people because it has to do with your altitude, your barometric pressure, the humidity in the room. Um, at, and when to add the ingredients. You do it after you turn the heat off, but you do it before the candy gets hard. It's It really is a challenge. All of our candy boards that we sell without the candy do come with a recipe. Pretty much if you follow that and you're a good candy maker, you can pull that off. Yeah, but that is, it is, can be tricky. Hi, Laura, how are you doing? I will not be around this fall to liquid feed my bees. Is, is it worthwhile to put on fondant instead? Yeah, I don't I don't see why not. 
Um, I've had discussions with people about fondant, and I was always taught that that kind of sugar bees is, isn't the best for bees. It's made out of, gran you know, small powdered granulated, what am I trying to say, like uh, smaller grains of sugar. But uh, I've used fondant, and it's worked fine. I, in the old days when I was experimenting what really worked good for bees, um, I would make fondant. And then I would also make winter bee kind boards. So I would just do little tests like that. I would put the fondant over here. I'd put the winter bee kind here. And then I would just have cameras and see how long did it take bees to go to it? Which one did they prefer the most? And so that they always prefer just table sugar that's made into a candy board that has, you know, protein and winter bee or uh, honey bee healthy in it, stuff like that. But there are a lot of people like Hive Alive, they sell fondant. A lot of my friends, I've, I've never used Hive Alive because I, I've already been feeding my bees winter bee kinds for well over a decade. But a lot of my friends love Hive Alive fondant on, on the winter time. A lot of people have, have found bees eating it. Let's put it this way. Hey, there's no secret, okay? Bees love sugar. <laughs> don't be surprised when somebody comes out with something cool and says oh my gosh we just made this thing and it's made out of sugar and we put something else in it and bees love it they eat it they, they're crazy about it hey get a clue haven't you seen bees around a trash can i mean they're drinking coca-cola honeybees are drinking coca-cola out of there's a nearby gas station that's within a few miles of me. And they've called me a few times and said, there's a lot of honeybees around our trash cans. Probably my bees, but don't tell anybody. And you know, what are they doing? They're drinking all the Coca-Cola crap that people throw in there. You got sugar? Bees are going to love it. Hey, Tom, how are you doing? Great, great string of videos you put out this fall. Super content. It was great uh, bee season here because of your help. You and Sherry are great. Hey, thanks, Tom. Appreciate it a lot. Tom is actually going to be on our live stream next Thursday night. Going to have Tom with us. So really looking forward to that. I don't ever think I've ever seen Tom and what his face looks like, but uh, it'd be fun. I've talked a lot to Tom, so that'd be a fun time. So anyway, uh, fondant will work fine, I'm sure. You just don't want to give bees brown sugar, dark sugar. That's not good for them. Hey, Ruth, how are you doing? I have a deep with a plastic frame and empty three mediums with comb, brood, and honey. Should I remove the deep and overwinter with the medium? Not sure why you want to do that. Is there nothing in your deep? I have a deep with plastic frames and empty. Maybe you mean empty deep. Uh, let me see. Would I remove that empty deep? Mm, I'd say a coin toss. I mean, if you leave it on there, the bees are just going to go up into it, up into the top of your, of your three mediums. Um, coin toss. Yeah. 50-50 either way. I don't think it's going to make a bit of difference. I might be tempted to go ahead and, um, yeah, I might be tempted to take it off. Yeah, I think I would. I think I'd want my bees kind of condensed, especially with the solid bottom board, condensed lower. Uh, but the heat rises. Good question. Let's go with 51% says take it off. Take that deep off. Condense them into three mediums. What do I know? <laughs> Hey, Gene, is it better to overfeed in the fall to get ready for winter or consistent feeding during winter? Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. I have failed, and it doesn't mean that, the, that I know the answer to this. But when I tried to overfeed in the fall to get ready for winter, that always failed me. It really did. It failed me. It failed me because when my bees clustered, they couldn't get to the food that was beside of them. Because we get really, really cold, like 20 below, and they cluster, and there's frames like this, right? <laughs> and the bees don't have a good time going through a wall. They have to go, you know, under and back around to move as a cluster. So when I invented the winter bee kind board, it sits on top of the cluster. So the big ball of clusters separated by the frames are able to go up and eat all this candy all winter long. So... Didn't work for me to feed and get them all built up for winter unless I had a, like a honey super on, but keeping feed over the top of them works better. Yep, works a lot better. Thank you, Tracy, for your super sticker. Uh, I appreciate that so much. Really do. You guys have some good questions tonight. Hey, Zach, 
Love your feeder boards. I purchased four this year and it has really helped. Yeah, I. Um, it's amazing what some people uh, tell us after they've used our Winter Be Kind boards, how outstanding their colonies come out of winter, how strong they are. And let's face it, in, you know, the, the nutrition is everything when it comes to bees. If the, if the mites have been under control, they don't have a lot of viruses or other pathogens, and they're well fed all winter long, bees prosper. They really do. They really do well when they're well fed. Thank you. I appreciate that, Zach. That's kind of you to say. Yep. Um, yeah, I uh, I think feeding bees uh, all winter long has really been good for me. I know some people are still like, ooh, that scares me. I don't think you should. I think it's going to be a problem. It's always worked out great for me to keep feeding them really, really uh, all winter long. It's been great. Hey, let's have a let's have a giveaway. I'd like to give away one of our ultimate online beekeeping courses worth $289. So we're going to have a giveaway. Wait a minute. What time is it? I want to say the giveaway to a little bit later. Yeah, I'm going to take a few more questions before the giveaway. And the reason I'm doing that, not to hold you here that long, but um, Jessica and Sherry says that when we do a giveaway, it blows up the comments and they lose a lot of good questions. And so we'll just, uh, we'll do that just in a minute. We'll take a few more questions first, make it easier on you guys. Brad Marshall, uh, do you think it's a good idea to put a piece of newspaper on top of your hive and feed your bees during the winter granulated sugar? No, I don't. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that it doesn't work. I'm not saying that some people probably have great success with it. And I'm not saying that it might be the best thing since sliced bread. I'm just saying, for me, yeah, I don't like the idea. Um, the reason I don't like it is because it's going to take a ton of moisture to take that essentially crystallized table sugar and dilute it enough where bees can essentially drink it, right? Because that's what bees do. They drink honey. They eat, consume through a proboscis, a straw-like. And I know they can chew a little bit, but gosh, hard, hard sugar is hard on our teeth. And bees don't have teeth. <laughs> you can break your tooth on a gumball. How many of you ate gumballs as a kid? <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, I loved a gumball. And they were like big gumballs about this big. They were, they were hard. And people choked on them. But, you know, bees can't really chomp down on hard sugar. So I'm not a big fan of that. I'd rather give them something where, like in, in a candy board. I didn't invent candy boards. I invented the winter be kind, but the candy boards have been around since a long time ago, 1800s, 1700s. And the moisture of the hive goes up into the candy and, and we tweak that so that it allows the bees to kind of slurp that up as, the, as it dilutes. Yeah, good question though. I've, I've heard people doing that a lot. Hey, Alan, my horizontal hive has 18 frames with 10 frames of brood. All of the honey is on one side. Do you move the brood to the center? Um, I'm not an expert on horizontal hives, but I would say, I don't think I would, but maybe you need to consult with an expert first, but it seems like the bees have set it up that way. Um, and you don't know which way they're moving. I know I used to have top bar hives and they always put the honey, you know, on one side and the brood on the other side. I just kind of loved it that way like that. Um, hmm, good question. I'm going to make a note of that. I'm still learning about the whole horizontal thing, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But I would, I would probably leave it the way it is. Thank you for your super sticker. Farlumbulus. Farlumbulus. Thank you. I appreciate that super sticker. You guys that make donations, that really means a lot to me. I really appreciate it. You're very kind to do that. Yes, very kind. All right. Other questions that you want to throw at me tonight? Looks like I see a lot of questions that uh, Sherry and Jessica are going through, looking through things. I'm watching my clock here. we got a few more time for questions. All right. Brad Marshall again. Did we already do that? I have one colony in two deep boxes. And when I did my before winter inspection, I found 10 full frames of brood out of 20 frames. Is that good or bad? 10 full frames of brood. That is excellent, Brad. Oh my gosh, that is uh, phenomenal. Yeah, that's great. I'm proud of that. I want that hive. That's a good queen. That'd be bees of winter physiology. Did a mite test, had four mites per 300. Uh, should I treat? Marginal there on percentage wise. Uh, 
you know, three mites would bring you at 3%. And so you're a little bit above that. I'm going to go, Nick, with treating. Yes, I think so. Treating is always going to be better because, you know, when we say four mites per 300, everybody thinks four mites. But if you do the math, that's a lot of mites throughout the hive that are biting into your bees and getting buried into developing pupae. So, yeah, I would treat it. Definitely would just be on the safe side. You're over the backyard limit of backyard beekeeping limit of three. So I think it'd be wise to treat it. Hey, Susan, took off my super and left my wax cappings outside for the bees to clean up. At the end of the day, it looked like a lot of bees had drowned in the honey. What happened? 60 degrees. Took off my top super, left the wax cappings outside. Um, sometimes what happens, Susan, is that the bees will become very, very aggressive to get what they want out of that honey super. They actually start fighting each other. I bet you anything, there was a lot of fighting and uh, competition to get what little honey was left as they cleaned up those wax cappings for sure. Um, if there was a lot of honey in there, like a liquid honey that was kind of pooled somewhere, bees can get caught up in that. They're not used to having pools of liquid honey because bees need to be able to get out of it. In a hive, you don't see, you know, big blobs of honey. So they can get, they can drown. They have spiracles on the side of their bodies for oxygenation. Those spiracles, unlike our lungs, those spiracles can get clogged up and they just run out of oxygen. Probably what happened, fighting or just got into a little pool of whack or honey or something like that. That's what I'm guessing. Thank you, Mark. I found a new colony. Oh, that's you again with the bottom of my beehive last week. Put the new colony into an old beehive and they seem to be enjoying it. Well, good. That's a great way of doing it. Absolutely. Oh, that's going to be interesting to see if they can make it through winter, build up enough for that. Yeah, I like that. Hi, Tara. Should I worry about overcrowding if I'm wintering in a single deep? Hmm. Uh, you know, anytime a colony is overcrowded, there's a chance if there's a nectar flow for them to swarm. I'm thinking if there's not a nectar flow, I'm not going to worry about it too much, to tell you the truth. Bees can still do strange things, but if they're overcrowded in a single deep, a lot of those bees are summer bees. They're going to thin out really fast now that they're aging out. So I wouldn't worry about it. Should never worry about bees anyway. There's more worse things to worry about, but no, I think you'll be fine. Oh, happy life. What a great name. What keeps candy boards from falling out? You know what? It, it's not really that crucial. Um, I have done a lot of studies originally on my candy boards. Bees sometimes drill under it, go under it and knock it down to make it go, fall down onto the hive deliberately. I've watched them do that. Um, so that's why they're built the way they are. There's no distance, really. There's just a little bit of space for the bees to walk. So if it if it loosens and goes to the top of the frames, the bees just eat it anyway between the frames. We used to lay, you know, you lay, you lay uh, pollen patties. A lot of times people lay pollen patties on top of frames. You treat with Formic Pro on top of frames. Not a big deal. If it falls out, it's not a big deal. Nope. Thanks, EL, for your super sticker tonight. I appreciate that. I wanted to thank Thomas, too. Uh, he left a donation for that. I appreciate that, Thomas. Saw that earlier. Thanks a lot. All right, I'm going to take about two or three more questions, then we'll have our giveaway. I see lots of videos on feeding bananas. Any thoughts? A lot of people fear that banana smell is the same chemical compound that you see in the bee venom. And it is. It's the same type of, it's the same chemicals and same smell. But what you have to realize is John Zavishlock and I did a study on this. Um, we made a video. It's on my YouTube channel. My 600 videos. John and I tried everything we could to make this a problem by hanging bananas on a black sock and irritating a hive with it. We found that it really doesn't make a lot of difference. When you throw a, you throw a banana on front of a bottom board, bees don't really care about it. In fact, bees love bananas. They love to eat bananas. It's sweet. Did I tell you? Anything sweet, bees love it. And bananas, fruit like that are sweet, so bees love it. But I know we probably always try to be safe and say, don't eat bananas before you work a hive because you smell like alarm pheromone. But we've tested it and it really didn't stand to be the case with us in that particular, you know, one time little study we did. 
Um, but we did find the bees were a little more irritated with a banana and a black sock than they were just a black sock. You can watch the video we made if, if, that, if, that, if you remember doing that. Okay. Uh, maybe one more question, then we'll do our giveaway. We have some good time closing up here tonight. Give me a good question that might be a, a, a big stumper, maybe make me think. <laughs> Any questions? Here, Lisa is our last question for the evening. How long does it take bees in the fall dirt to begin forming winter physiology? And should I begin feeding after that? Yeah, that's not really scientifically um, exact. Like we don't know. I think they can start raising bees of winter physiology probably as early as late September. I'm sorry, as late August, depending on your climate and conditions, but certainly in September. And oh my gosh, like right now, big time. <laughs> yeah, right now, big time in October. Um, so usually after a dearth, I always kind of like to wait a couple of weeks after bees kind of realize flowers are done and I need to, we need to get ready to, we just don't have anything. So let's raise bees of winter physiology. They'll know that. Okay, now listen up, folks. We're going to give away one of our ultimate online beekeeping courses to a winner. Here's what you need to do. You need to leave a comment, hashtag class, not capital C, all lowercase so you qualify, and then we'll randomly draw a winner. All right, so in the comments right now, hashtag C-L-A-S-S, class. Leave those comments, and then we'll be able to um, draw a name of a winner in just a moment. That'd be really cool. So let's see. Yep, there it is. Uh, okay. Start selecting comments. Let me do that. So start collecting comments. There we go. All right. All right. We got 75 people hoping to win the ultimate beekeeping course. I made these online beekeeping course uh, many years ago before COVID. Maybe it was like 2016, 17, 18. I don't remember. But then uh, my online courses became very popular during COVID when people couldn't go to beekeeping uh, classes anymore one-on-one uh, -on -one or, or in a group setting. They lost all their mentors and all. So classes became very popular. So people have uh, really enjoyed the online beekeeping courses that I teach. So you may want this ultimate course. By the way, the ultimate course does come with how to get your bees through the winter course where I talk more in depth of things you probably have never heard me say before on my videos. I'm sure of it. Vitelogenesis and all that stuff, you know, bees of winter physiology. So a little more in-depth on beekeeping courses. And let me say this too about my beekeeping courses online. Some of you probably feel like, well, I can watch all David's videos and uh, why would I need to take one of his beekeeping courses? He seems to tell me everything about bees on his YouTube videos. Um, probably not. I don't know, maybe, but certainly not any not in any organized manner. And so in a beekeeping course, I think by taking a course, you can sit down in front of uh, your, your video, uh, like your TV or your computer or your phone, and you can dedicate time to learn about bees rather than just kind of pot shotting videos here and there. It may not ever solidify in your mind together uh, like it should. You need a good foundation. And I think beekeeping classes help that happen when you uh, dedicate time. Now, these video classes, like the one we're giving away today, it is a, it's videos of me teaching you. Some of it, some of it's face-to-face, -face, like I'm talking now, some of it's in the hive, but it's not a Zoom meeting. It never goes away. It's you watching videos of me teaching you, okay? And you can watch them at your leisure anytime you want to. You can pause it, watch it later. They don't go away. You don't have to do any fancy things. It's just watching videos. So it, we made it easy for you to do. Okay, we're up to about 100 and... 59 people ready to draw. Let's see who will be the winner of our, let's give you a minute. Quick, get in there. Hashtag class 160. Let's draw. Okay. Wow. Look at the names going by. Who'll be our winner? Okay. Here we go. Slowing down a little bit. Angela. Wow. There you go. Angela. If you will email longlanehoneybees at gmail.com. My staff will get that class sent out to you via email. If the rest of you try to contact me personally at that email address, I never see that. It's just a winning email. So if you try to send more questions or more comments through that email address, 
I wouldn't bother. You'll be disappointed and frustrated. <laughs> so, but Angela, we want you to use that email address and uh, let us know you won so we can send that out to you. Thanks guys for participating today. That's great. I appreciate it. Uh, we got about five minutes left. So I want to take this last five minutes to thank Jessica so much and Sherry. And look at this Beak Squad shirt that I have. I've got a Beak Squad hat. I kind of start, start wearing that more, but I love the Beak Squad. And I'm going to be at Cayman Reynolds' new uh, conference, the Honey Bee Expo in Louisville at the conference center there on January the 4th through the 6th. I'd like for you to wear these shirts and we can get a big picture taken of all the Beak Squad at the conference. That'd be so fun. So get your shirt ordered. Uh, can you put that up again where they order their shirt? Where do they, what do they log into? Oh, there it is. Beak Squad merch. Yeah. And we have a good friend, uh, met him at the Content Convergence, Creator Convergence in Ohio, Robbie and Candy that make these shirts for us, for you guys. So I really appreciate them helping us out as well. That's going to be really great. So uh, Jessica and Sherry, thanks so much for being here. And um, we've got Jessica lined up in the future uh, to be on here to talk bees a little bit more. She's uh, a good beekeeper. We want to get some uh, uh, time where we can talk to Jessica. A lot of you guys know Jessica. I mean, not maybe not know her, but you've seen her in the comment section. So that's really her job is to be in the comment section and kind of interact with you guys over there more because Sherry and I can't really watch everything. So Jessica is kind of like uh, becoming part of the furniture here at the live stream. Uh, so she uh, she enjoys uh, that a lot. And I know you enjoy her. So it'd be good for you guys um, to get to know her a little better and uh, what she looks like. Um, so that'd be fun. And she's, I'll let you know ahead of time when Jessica's are going to be on with us. So that'd be good. So I want to thank you guys for being part of Beak Squad. I hope uh, keeping bees has been healthy for you. I hope it's been a plus. I do see some people taking it much too serious and getting freaked out and worried and fretting and having anxiety. That's not the purpose of beekeeping. Come on. Beekeeping is supposed to reduce your anxiety, reduce your depression, uh, kind of be outdoors, soaking up sunlight, enjoying it. It's all about perspective and how you view it. So it's okay if your bees die and perish. It's, it's not the end of the world. It's the end of that hive. You've gained information. You learned from your mistakes. You fall forward. You fail forward. Move forward. Do better next time with what you gain, what information you gain. It's not the end of the world. Don't, you know, I've had people cry. I mean, I understand that. I think when I lost my first time, I wanted to cry. <laughs> but, you know, you got to toughen up and let beekeeping be something that connects you with nature, relaxation, fun, and watch the bees and learn from the bees how they all get along and they work together and they accomplish tasks. That's so important. I, I'm excited to see more and more beekeepers working together. That's why I love the guys from the stream team, uh, Greg Burns, not related to me, but maybe, and uh, Brian and Bruce. I love them because what they're promoting is collaboration between beekeepers where we're not competing on YouTube. We're not trying to outdo each other. We're not trying to, you know, out, out perform one another or out be a better beekeeper than another. Um, I like what Greg always says rising tides right raises all ships so i think we all are better off when we help each other accomplish each other's dreams and hopes we support each other so that's really important to me to be someone that can really be um a, a place a lighthouse for you guys i want to i want to kind of say this uh, before i leave tonight i was looking through my comments today and uh, wow, there was a comment from someone who said something in the nature of, I watch your I watch your beekeeping videos because I don't have a dad. And every time I watch you explain bees, I pretend that you're my dad teaching me about bees. Oh my gosh. Oh, that was very humbling. So I, I realized the responsibility that I have, that, that we have on YouTube, to really be a lighthouse, to be a shining beacon, to help people, help people in life. I know some of you are going through crises, uh, health issues. Maybe you're struggling financially. Maybe you're having a difficult time, um, family relationships. Maybe you've had some 
calamity, tragedy, whatever in your life. And uh, that's hard. It's stress and unhappiness is, is brutal. Let's just face it, it's brutal. But I want to be somebody that you can tune into on a regular basis, present a smile and say, I can't relate to what you're going through, but I do want to encourage you to hang in there and be tough. You know, I love you and I appreciate you. I appreciate you being part of our group here. And uh, people are more important to me than bees. And uh, I, I like what I hear Greg Burns say sometimes is, Bees are just a way to get to people. So bees are just a way to draw you into my YouTube channel so I can connect with you and encourage you and be your friend, your YouTube friend. And uh, yeah, I think that's cool. I, I really do. So thank you all tonight for being here. You guys are the best. Thank you, Sherry and Jessica. And uh, i tell you what, guys, um, I'm looking forward to more videos that I can make to, to encourage you guys and to help you with your beekeeping. I'll say bye for now. See you in the next videos.